just stop by ya Only takes a week Helps make my skin so white Make my skin so smooth Palm Olive Naturals White Plus Papaya Me 100% Natural Orange Papaya Extracts Para ang skin whiter at smoother feeling in one week White Plus Papaya My skin so white Para sa puting pang Diyosa Palm Olive Naturals White Plus Papaya Feel your skin and soul sing my name is Laurier and welcome to my channel Old Dirty History where I like to talk about whatever person, place, or event that I want to talk about. And today I want to talk about the history of skin bleaching. Yes, I know. Very random. But uh, actually when I think about it, maybe not so random, at least for this channel. When I think about all the other things I've talked about, they are kind of all over the place. So you know what? Never mind. This feels right. This was supposed to happen. Skin bleaching has always been something I've been curious about. Not to skin bleach myself, but just where it comes from, you know, its background. So I was like, you know, why not? Let's learn something new about skin bleaching. So in this video, I will be talking about the history of skin bleaching, where it comes from, and how its history has impacted the present day. Now there is a chance that someone may stumble upon this video who is in fact interested in bleaching their skin. And so this isn't meant to be a guide or really even an opinion piece on skin bleaching. And it's also not meant to encourage or discourage anyone from pursuing skin bleaching. However, with that being said, I'm going to keep it a buck. So anything that's related to its harm or whatever, I'm not going to stray away from. The truth shall set you free. But I'm also going to try to approach this from an unbiased perspective. But with that being said, I am human, so I'll do my best. In this video, I will be diving into the history of skin bleaching, as well as its contemporary use, its impact on cultures all around the world, what these products are made of, and the risks associated with its use in the past, as well as in the present day. And trigger warning, I will be talking about these topics throughout this video. So, you have been warned. Without further ado, let's get- oh! By the way, before I forget, there's construction going on in the house that is connected to my house and it has become the bane of my existence. But if you hear any construction noise in the background, that is why. So without further ado, let's get into it. Skin bleaching has many names depending on the region. It's also known as artificial or cosmetic skin lightening or depigmenting. In some parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, it is referred to as simply makeup. In the Congo, it's known as stripping. And in Mali, it's called ambi. Today, skin lightening is a booming business in the Americas, across Asia, Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. The industry anticipates reaching 31.2 billion USD by 20. 2024. And for decades, Japan has had the skin lightener market on lock, but now India and China are giving them a run for their money. However, skin lighteners have been used by people from all over the world from all walks of life. From Bollywood and Hollywood celebs, to the world's richest, to everyday people like myself, and to people living below the poverty line and across all genders. Attempts to lighten the skin date all the way back to ancient Mesopotamia and Egypt from the 4th millennium BCE. During this time, makeup was mostly used for religious, symbolic, and therapeutic purposes. And even then, lead-based blushes were used to lighten the skin. The earliest known historical reference to products labeled for skin whitening purposes was mentioned in the first century CE by Roman philosopher Pliny the Elder. He describes plants used by women to lighten their complexion and erase facial stains. I have never heard of facial stains before. It, it sounds, sounds kind of gross. It sounds like a dirty rag. Pliny the Elder also mentions using minerals like lead carbonate to lighten their complexion as well. And repeated exposure to lead carbonate can cause anemia, peripheral nerve damage, kidney impairment, and other health issues. What's interesting is that even at this time, ancient Romans were aware of the risks associated with skin lightening, but the desire outweighed the risks. Now, if we look specifically at how people interacted with each other in society during the ancient era in relation to skin tone, it's actually very interesting. 
In ancient Egypt and other parts of the ancient Mediterranean world, people mingled together across a variety of skin tones, but women were often portrayed as having fairer skin. There are some theories that suggest these depictions are a reflection of different lifestyles. Like for example, men having a darker complexion because their work required them to be outside in the sun more often compared to women at the time. And again, this is just a theory. This isn't to say that women during this period never worked outdoors, but that is one theory that historians have come to. Scholars also came to the conclusion that social status and race did not appear to play a role in skin lightening in ancient times. And this is because the concept of race did not exist yet in the ancient era or the Middle Ages. This was a concept that wasn't invented by people until the 18th century. This is future Laurier. Uh, while editing this video, I realized that I wanted to extrapolate more on this portion of the video for just a moment, because I think it's important to look more closely at the concept of race in order to better understand the prevalence of skin lightening. This will make more sense once we get further into the video. So I I think it's important to know that the concept of race was invented by European anthropologists and naturalists. And if you're not aware of what naturalists are, they're people who observe relationships between living organisms and their environments one of the most famous of them being Charles Darwin. Scholars identify the beginning of the concept of race, starting with the publication of a book called Systema Naturae, and this was published in 1735. This book was written by a then 28-year-old Swedish naturalist named Carl Linnaeus. In this book, Linnaeus classifies humankind into four varieties. And I say varieties because he did not use the word race, but in essence, this classification is what we now know of as race today. These varieties included European or white, Asian or yellow, American or red, and African or black. These varieties were created based on continental location and skin color. And this invention of Linnaeus has created a devastating domino effect across humanity because it acted as a buttress to support some of the most evil acts of violence against humanity, like for example, race-based genocide and slavery. This type of thinking was so impactful that it even influenced the way library classification systems function. You may be familiar with the Dewey Decimal System, especially if you grew up in the 90s like I did or before that period. It's an approach many libraries used to classify books and many libraries still use this classification Perfect. system today. So here are some examples as to why this classification system was so problematic. This system separated African-American history from just regular American history. Also woman's work would be separated from jobs as if it wasn't a job, as if women did not have jobs. So it was an extremely racist, sexist, ableist, and xenophobic classification system. You might be thinking, okay, those are weird, but it, they're not that extreme. Well, check out these examples. This is a classification of persons. And as you can see here, you've got deaf and dumb, Negroes and freedmen, and feeble-minded. This is how people were being classified within institutions that operated as hubs of information. In this other example, we have categories like color and man, and under it, we have craniology. And I'm not even gonna get into brain size and, and cranial size versus race, like it's a whole thing. And I mean, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Having a background in librarianship, I could go on and on about this, but that's a video for another time. Of course, the Dewey Decimal System has been revised since then, but this is how people thought back then. And libraries are still staples for information, but even more so back then. 
especially without the internet. And this is a prime example of how the way information was funneled to the public and how heavily it was influenced by the concept of race introduced by this book, System and Nature. Anyway, that's the end of my addendum to this video. Back to our scheduled programming. Now that's not to say that bias and stereotypes did not exist yet. The practice of associating worth to skin color just wasn't a thing yet, but ideas about connecting pigmentation to geographic location in relation to the distribution of ultraviolet radiation was not an unfamiliar concept. So it was known at this time that the closer you were to the equator or to ultraviolet rays, the darker your skin would be. Prejudices about people were more often made regarding their culture, their moral characteristics, their physical attributes, and their intellect. The 16th through the 18th centuries was a wild time for skin lightening. Oh boy. Because there are works that were written in this period that detail recipes instructing people on how to whiten the skin. And um, it's something else. Many of these recipes were based on magic and symbolism, not so much pharmacology. The Dark Lord shall rise. So for example, it was recommended to become lighter, one should eat white foods or dress in white linens. And this idea is based on the principle of like attracts like. It kind of reminds me of those cringy videos you see of people trying to manifest the dumbest of shit into their lives as if they have control over it. I manifested my eye color changing and I want to show you the results. Here's a photo of my eye from about a year ago. And here's a photo of my eye from about a month ago. The eyes are the nipples of the face. Yeah, I'm sure that's working out well for you. Now, some people would take it a few steps further than this to obtain lighter skin. Many steps further, many. Some people would add lead carbonate and mercury sublimate to their blushes. Mercury was commonly used to lighten the skin during the 16th century, even though its toxicity was known at this time. I'm not sure if it was a widely known thing by consumers during that period, but its existence as being a toxic substance was known. And actually, mercury is still found in some beauty products today, specifically skin lighteners. And now if we're specifically looking at Europe during this period, both men and women sought lighter skin because at this time it became very in fashion. Light white skin was a sign of aristocracy, you know, the wealthy and the powerful, not you peasants out there getting all dark skin doing your hard labored work. And I'm sure you've seen this style that I'm describing in maybe like a movie or a TV show or somewhere in pop culture where the guy is dressed up in this ridiculously over powdered makeup and then they've got the big uh, white bouffant wig, you know. It was very cool, very trendy. It was the supreme jacket or hoodie of its time the box eyebrow of the 17th century. And it didn't matter to them that these products were super toxic. Fortunately, cosmetics containing lead decreased over time from 1541 to 1770 until it was eventually condemned. It would finally disappear at the end of the 18th century. Now that's specifically looking at just makeup. Unfortunately, when it comes to skin lightening products, these products continue to have mercury in them. And like I said, some products for skin lightening still have mercury in them today. And that brings us to skin bleaching products in the 20th century. Skin bleaching continued to be a very popular cosmetic pursuit into the 20th century up until the present day. By this point in history, cosmetic manufacturers and biomedical experts acknowledged that the most common ingredients for skin lightening products at that time were toxic. These ingredients being ammoniated mercury and mercuric chloride. But at the same time, these experts also agreed that these ingredients were the most effective skin lightening agents available. This is because mercurial compounds restrain melanin production by interfering with the enzyme tyrosinase. So being aware of how 
toxic these ingredients were at this time, why were people still using them? Colonization is the subjugation of a people and or territory for political, religious, or economic reasons. And all of this ultimately equates to the pursuit of power and quite often for financial gain. An example of colonization or colonialism is like when the Spanish came to Latin America to conquer the Aztec and the Incan empires. When you look at regions across the entire world where skin lightning seems to be most prevalent, the common denominator that unites almost all of these places is colonization. Some of these countries include South Africa, Jamaica, the Philippines, the United States, and India. Now that by no means is a comprehensive list of every single country where skin bleaching was or currently is popular. We'd be here forever if I touched on every single country where skin bleaching is that girl. So for the sake of time, I'm just gonna focus on a handful of areas. So now let's dig into the history of a few of these regions to see how skin bleaching became so popular in these vastly different areas. South Africa has a rough history when it comes to colonization. Its people were under European rule for over two centuries, and of course, there was apartheid. If you're not familiar with what apartheid was, it was a system of institutionalized racial segregation imposed upon South Africa from 1948 until the early 1990s. White citizens were regarded as the dominant population, and this is very similar to segregation in the US but also different in many ways. What's really mind-blowing to me is that apartheid went on up until the 1990s. Wow. Like, in the 1990s, I was busy playing Power Rangers with my friends in the alley and drinking Capri Suns. I did not have to worry about these type of shenanigans. That makes me want to cry. Like, when I really think about that type of shit, it really makes me sad for humanity. Colonization did a number on South Africa, and this type of institutionalized racism really encouraged the scrutinization of skin color. And this is unsurprising because the way white supremacists in 20th century South Africa enforced apartheid was through identifying and dividing the population into four categories. These categories included native or Bantu, European, Asian, and mixed or colored. And the mixed or colored category was kind of like this catch-all for anybody who didn't neatly fit into the individual categories they created, at least in their eyes. Now, I also came across a different variation of this four-tiered category. I also saw Bantu, colored, uh, Indian, and white, replacing the Asian for Indian. So just in case someone's like, oh no, that's wrong. I came across two variations of this extremely racist hierarchy. So yes, not sure which one is correct, but that's what I found in my research. Honestly, if you ask me, it's all stupid. What, what does that even mean? This approach to segregation via visual characteristics differs from the approach the US used during their period of segregation, which was the one drop rule. And if you're not familiar with what the one drop rule was, it was a legal principle of racial classification that stated if a person had even one black ancestor, that person was considered to be black. Well, in apartheid South Africa, this form of racism and segregation did not solely depend on this clear distinction of black and white. It was much more granular than that. A lot of thought and effort was put into this form of subjugation. It relied on racialized geographic and linguistic affiliations. For people living in this four-tiered racial hierarchy, their everyday lives were impacted depending on which category they fell into. And this form of racism was so granular that even a slight variation or difference in skin tone from another person could completely 
change or affect the way you lived, what opportunities you were given, where you could go, who you could be around. Skin tone carried very significant social and political weight. And it was this culture that made skin lightening products in South Africa a hot commodity. So I had to take a little bit of a break because I've been dealing with a really nasty cold over the past few days, so I had to stop. So picking back up, let's keep going. So here are some ads that can be found in a South African magazine called Drum. Drum was a magazine founded during apartheid in 1951, and it was modeled after U.S. magazines like Ebony and Life. And it became one of the most influential magazines in South Africa. And ads for skin lightening products like this one that I'm about to show you were very common. This ad features a black woman whose name is mentioned in the ad in order to entice consumers to purchase the product. Because of this, I'm assuming she is some kind of celebrity. Unfortunately, I couldn't really find her on the internet, so I'm just assuming that she was somebody who was very popular in South Africa during this time. Anyway, this is what the ad says. Here's the advice of one of the loveliest Johannesburg mannequins, Miss Linda Malongo. I'm not sure what mannequin means in this context. Maybe this is a word used or that was previously used in South Africa to describe a woman who was considered to be beautiful. I'm not sure. It's kind of weird, but moving right along. In the ad, she's quoted as saying, for beauty, you need a clear light skin. And for clear light skin, you need, of course, the two Carol Freckle creams. And obviously these two creams that she's talking about are the creams that are being sold in this ad. And the ad goes on to describe the application process for the product, how much your life will drastically change if you use this product. And this product was actually one of the most popular skin lightening products in South Africa at this time. So now I wanna move over to a different area of the world, India. India is a diverse place and its people reflect this in a wide spectrum of skin tones and facial features based on the geographical area that they come from. So it's very shocking that over the past four decades, colorism has become a very big issue in Indian society. And if you don't know what colorism is, it's discrimination based on skin color where people who share similar ethnicities are treated differently based on skin tone and facial features. Here's an example of this phenomenon brought to you by Kodak Black. Take it away, Mr. Kodak. I don't feel like I have a need to simplify it again, but I'm gonna simplify it again. Okay, you know, I carry myself like I'm an average dude because I don't see myself no better than him, no better than him, you know, or no less than him. So if he could say that he likes skinny women, if he prefers skinny women more than a more chubby or heavy set women, he could say that and nobody won't get mad at him. I just said I don't like women with my complexion. I like light skinned women. I want you to be lighter than me. I love African American women, but I just don't like my skin complexion. Okay, okay. Well, I like we your skin gutter. complexion. We yeah, too gutter. Know, think... black, black people, my, my complexion, we too gutter. Light-skinned women, they more sensitive, you know? There's some dark-skinned women out here sensitive. No, nah, no, nah, 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 they too tough. They too tough. tough light-skinned women, we could break them down more easy, you know what I'm saying? That was real awkward. In ancient India, a person's worth was not based on skin color, even though colorism is such a huge issue in India in the present day. The earliest known form of classification was based on occupation, but this eventually evolved into the caste system we know of today. Scholars support this conclusion that skin color was inconsequential in ancient India based on what has been left behind in ancient texts. Some of the most powerful gods, goddesses, and princesses were described as being dark-skinned. For example, Krishna, the reincarnation of Lord Vishnu, is described as having a dark skin tone. And for those of you who don't know, Vishnu is a Hindu deity. In a stark comparison, when we're looking at the present day, villains and bad characters are usually portrayed as darker-skinned men who are defeated by fairer skinned heroes. So why this change? How did we go from having dark skinned heroes and gods to people of the same complexion being villainized in Indian entertainment? Take a wild guess.
Colonization. That's what happened. India was colonized by the British from 1858 to 1947. Because here were these fair-skinned people with different facial features claiming to be more superior and more intelligent. And as a result, those who had a darker complexion were now inferior. And these people who were of a fair skin complexion were the ones who were in charge, the ones with the power. And so we're in a situation where power equates to fair skin and vice versa. And of course, with power comes opportunities, education, money. You know, it's the same story unfolding once again. Places of business and academic institutions prohibited people labeled as black Indians from entering. Signs saying Indians and dogs not allowed could be found hanging outside of businesses. And of course, this also impacted job opportunities available to Indians. Indians were given random odd jobs or low ranked army positions. And even those jobs were difficult for darker skinned Indians to obtain because fairer skinned Indians were given preference. And the British, they made their intent to impose segregationist ideals on India as early as the 17th century. The East India Company established a settlement in the city of Madras in the early 17th century. The East India Company was a joint stock company founded in 1600 by the British with the purpose of trading in the Indian Ocean region. The settlement that they created was called Fort George, but they gave it a nickname. It was called White Town. No, I'm totally fine. Like, love it, love it, love it. And believe it or not, there was also an, a separate settlement that they created that was called Blacktown. And I will leave it to you to guess why it had that name. And over the years, it became very obvious that the British held this contempt for Indians. They did not try to hide it one bit. Winston Churchill once remarked, I hate Indians. They are a beastly people with a beastly religion. And it is these same type of people who ruled over India for close to 100 years. And during that time, colorist ideologies embedded themselves into Indian society. White skin was now associated with the ruling class, which equated to power, money, and beauty. Next on our tour is Jamaica. Jamaica has a very similar history when it comes to colonization and slavery, and its impact can be found today in Jamaica's culture and beauty standards. Jamaica became a British colony in 1707 and a crown colony in 1866, and it was primarily used for sugarcane production. Jamaica wouldn't get its independence until 1962. And from this history, division or colorism was born between lighter and darker complexioned enslaved people. In the US, this is more commonly known as the house slave, field slave dichotomy. And this is because of the same reasons that we found in India and South Africa. Lighter skinned Jamaicans were prioritized for jobs, education, and other opportunities over darker skinned Jamaicans. An example of this is the children of British colonizers who procreated with native Jamaicans. These offspring were often given priority or better opportunities than someone of a darker complexion. You couldn't work somewhere like uh, a bank if you were of a darker skin tone. Now that we've looked at the history of skin bleaching, I want to take this time to dive into its impact on the present day. Today in South Africa, believe it or not, it is actually illegal to sell skin bleaching products, any products claiming to bleach or lighten the skin. But one in three of South African women purchase these products. And that's because they are smuggled in. South African authorities will go into these shops, these stores, and they will confiscate these products, but then the vendors will just restock their shelves right over again. And the never ending cycle just continues. There are a variety of skin lightening products today on the market in South Africa. And although they are very illegal, they're very easy to obtain. In India, skin bleaching products are not illegal and Western beauty ideas can be found all throughout modern Indian media. TV and movie stars promote fairness products all the time. And this also applies to some of Bollywood's most beloved entertainers like superstars Shah Rukh Khan and John Abraham. For example, check out this commercial. Bhaiya, phir se meri sari fairness cream khatam kar di. Mard hokar ladkiyon wali cream. 
चुप चुप कर काहे को लड़कियों की क्रीम लगाए उनकी त्वचा है कोमल कोमल और तुम्हारी त्वचा नहीं उनके जैसी क्यों ना समझ तुम्हारे इमामी फेयर एंड हैंडसम आम फैन स्क्रीन मर्दों की सख्त त्वचा में नहीं समा पाते सिर्फ फेयर एंड हैंडसम में है अमेरिकन डबल स्ट्रेंथ पेप्टाइड और जड़ी बूटियाँ जो अंदर समाए और गोरा बनाए चार हफ्तों में And this type of culture has fostered an environment where it is darn near impossible for darker-skinned Indian entertainers to find work. Because of this, darker-skinned Indians may turn to skin bleaching products. It's estimated that the market size for fairness products in India is. 450 million USD, and the estimated annual market growth rate is between 15 and 20 percent. And some of India's most popular skin lightening products include Hindustan Lever Ltd, Cave and Care's Fair Ever, and the one and only Fair and Lovely, which occupies about 76 percent of the market. Now, if we briefly take a look at the skin lightening market in Jamaica today, business is booming. And this is not only just because of Jamaica's history with Western colonialism, but also because it's being popularized by some of Jamaica's biggest idols. A perfect example of this is dancehall artist Vibes Cartel. Vibes Cartel is a famous dancehall artist who a lot of young people look up to. And not only is it obvious that he has lightened his skin over the years, but he doesn't try to hide it. Some of these artists go as far as bragging about these products and advertising them. So, as a side note, these products are just out of control, in my opinion. I said I'm going to try to leave my bias out as much as I can, but that's specifically looking at the people who actually use these products. I'm not judging these people. What I am judging are these companies and the messed up products that they're creating. And oh my god. They're out of control, for real. I came across the existence of skin bleaching products with the purpose of lightening nipples and labia. Yep, and it gets worse. I don't know how true this one is, or if it's just a joke, or if it's a patent that never really saw the light of day on the market. I also came across a product called Tampax Deep White. And it is just as troubling as it sounds. It's supposed to be a tampon that not only absorbs but lightens the inside of the vagina. So, if you want a fair, bright, clear, clean, beautiful vagina, you can have it. Please don't do that. This video does not endorse skin lightening products in any way, including any that are supposed to be used for the inside of your vagina or nipples or labia. Don't do it. And some of the names of these products, just in general, are ridiculous. There, there's no better word for it. Okay, they're they're ridiculous. Like I came across a product called Placenta Sheep Cream. What's next? Cockapoo Foreskin Cream. Maybe I should get that patented. Cockapoo Foreskin Cream. A better foreskin in a fortnight. No, we can do better than that. A brighter day and a brighter way to clearer foreskin. Okay, I'm done. I'm not built for this market. Bitch, shut up. So, what's inside of these products? Let's take a deeper dive into what's inside of them today, and what has been inside of them in the 20th century. Which some of those ingredients from the 20th century are still in them today. So, let's take a look, shall we? So, here's what can be found in some skin lightening products. Hydroquinone, which is normally prescribed by doctors for temporary use to spot treat blemishes or hyperpigmentation, not for skin bleaching, and mercury. Yep, you heard right. Some of these products still contain mercury in them, even though we know mercury is bad. Companies are still making products that have mercury in them, so much so that the FDA had to create a web page. Devoted to warning people about some of these products, signs of mercury poisoning include tremors, changes in vision and/or hearing, memory issues, irritability, depression, and numbness and tingling of hands, feet, and around the mouth. Some people are even using a variety of different skin lightening products, mixing them together to create their own concoctions to make it super strong, so you can become super white. 
It's gonna be a, a whole new color. Get that patented. So I learned about these concoctions because I was watching this one documentary that is super fascinating that I found on YouTube. And in this documentary, Jamaicans were interviewed about how they felt about skin bleaching. And some of the interviewees were skin bleachers. And so in these interviews, you see these people mixing all these different products to make this, you know, super bleach cream. And it was truly terrifying because all I could think about was, oh my God, how freaking toxic is this shit? My heart goes out to people who feel like they need to use this. And at the same time, I was also kind of like, that. man, this really feels like overkill. <laughs> I mean, at that point, what kind of results are you trying to achieve? So I briefly touched on some of the risks associated with skin bleaching, but I want to take this time to really dive deeper into the risks and side effects when it comes to using these products, especially for extended periods of time. Skin bleaching products can cause users to have stretch marks, sensitive skin, thinning skin that gets easily damaged, a chalky skin tone, which I saw quite a bit in videos that I was watching, and I have to say, it doesn't look good. It's it's not good. You can also get an uneven skin tone in tougher surfaces like the knuckles or other joint-based areas are much harder to lighten. So users are sometimes left with darker joint areas in comparison to the lightened areas. And I'm sorry, but that combined with the chalky look is very unsettling. You can also become more susceptible to infection, elevated blood sugar, hypertension, easily burned from the sun, and actually going into the sun after bleaching can cause the skin to become darker than the user's original complexion. And finally, these products can cause kidney failure, skin cancer, and abnormalities in newborns. And so when I think about all of these risks associated with using these type of products, and that people are aware of them quite often and they still proceed to use them, it makes me think in my mind not to judge that person, but more so the world has really failed people of color, you know, um, from all walks of life, from all over the world. And I feel like the skin bleaching market is a perfect example of this, to feel like Matter of fact, no, to know that, because in some of these cases, to know that the only way that you can achieve a quote, happy life or success is through hurting yourself. And those risks are worth more to you than your life. We're doing something wrong. As a species, we are doing something wrong. And that's the history of skin bleaching. These companies are truly shameful. In the countries that I talked about, again, these aren't the only countries where the skin bleaching market is really popping. You know, I didn't even talk about the Philippines or the US, also Korea, and, and that's not it. There's more, very much so out of control. Anyways, thank you so much for watching this video. Uh, real quick before I go, I just want to give a special shout out to all of my subscribers. I noticed that over the new year, we've reached 100 subscribers. That really warms my cold, frozen heart. You guys are amazing. Thank you. I'm so happy that you guys enjoy my content and uh, I hope that you continue to do so. So stay safe out there. Until the next time. Bye.